Okay, so we talked about passive transport, but active transport. So what does active transport, what's the big difference? Passive transport, you don't necessarily need additional energy or nutrients, but active transport, you need a little boost to actually move something. So I like to use this analogy. So here we have a car, and does it actually take, so you park your car on a hill, like say you park it on like in San Francisco on a hill or Makakila Drive on a hill, and then you put your car in neutral. What will happen to your car over time? Just by the energy from being up on that hill, and we're not going to talk about potential and kinetic energy in this class, but you know if you put a car in neutral on a hill, it's going to roll down by itself. Did you need to apply the gas pedal, or, or I guess if you have a hybrid or electric car, did you need to press the, on the acceleration? Nope, if you put it on neutral, then it just does it by itself. So you go from a high energy to a low energy. Now how about this? From low energy to high energy, if you're going uphill, now you have to climb that hill and go all the way up the hill. What do you need to do? You need to apply the gas or accelerator somehow, right? So this is what you need to do. You have to move the car from low energy to high energy. Yep. And I know it's like you're so high energy, your rear tires are lifting off the ground. But I, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> so this is what active transport is. You're going from something that's low energy and have to move it in the area that's already high energy. Now, what do I mean by energy? Well, the thing is that, again, simplified version, let's talk about just one solute for now. What we have here are all these sodium ions, and what, where does we have a higher sodium ion concentration? We have too many sodium ion concentrations on that, or not too many, but we have a higher sodium con ion concentration in the fluid surrounding the cells. Now, say we open one of those ion channels. So what if we try to move a uh, sodium ion from a low concentration to a high concentration? Well, it's easy to move from high to low concentration because it's just facilitated diffusion. But going the opposite way is a lot harder. And why is that? Well, the thing is that just like how negative attracts positive and vice versa, positive also re repels positive, negative repels negative. So what we have here is if we have a sodium we're trying to move from low to high concentration, the sodium ions already there are kind of going to kind of, and we're just talking about sodium in this example, are going to push back the sodium ion. So it's going to repel it and force it back to where it came from. So this is why it's really hard to go from a low concentration to a high concentration. Because the more, of, more you stack one ion or a solute on one side of the membrane, it gets hard to add more and more of that same ion to that side. So I like to use this other analogy. So maybe you have a closet or a suitcase, and then you're trying to pack a lot of things into that closet or drawer or suitcase. So it's easy at first, but what happens if you just pack more and more into that space? Well, the more you add stuff to that space, you notice that eventually you kind of have to like use more energy and force to actually add more to some place that's already crowded. So the more you add to this place, the more the space, the more it's going to push back. So eventually you'll reach a point where if you try to add more, it's really hard to add more because there's so much crammed there, there already. So it's like that with trying to move something from a low concentration to a high concentration. The high concentration of solutes is going to push back and make it really hard to get that low. So how do you get that final last bit of article of clothing into your suitcase? You kind of apply a lot of pressure and energy. Same with the like, active transport. So how do we do it? We add energy via active transport. And what we have here is a classic membrane transport protein. And this is a sodium potassium exchange pump. Somebody won a Nobel Prize for this back in the day. And when we get to the neurons later on in the semester, this is very, very important. And especially if you're going to medicine, nursing, you definitely got to, and pharmacology, you gotta know this one for sure. And I'm if you're taking the MCAT, I'm glad I'm getting like this is like classic. It's gonna be appear in some form. But what does it require? It requires something called ATP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So this is the adenosine part right here. But tri, again, just, just like a tricycle has three wheels, a uh, triphosphate means it has one, two, three phosphates. Now, why is this molecule important in active transport? Well, it's kind of like if you ever 
well, you can't play it at Ice Palace, but if you ever played it, like, in Playground, or if you ever played it in, like, a, in another rink where they allow you to play this game called Crack the Whip, like, uh, it's all these people holding hands, and then somebody leads the, the crowd of line of people, but who gets the most action, the person in the front or the person at the very end? Just look at, I mean, if you've seen people play that, then you notice that the person at the end who's at the very end, they get whipped around, they have a lot of energy. I like to think of it similar to in the ATP molecule. The further you get from this, the higher energy it gets. So the cool thing about adenosine triphosphate is that if you break the bond between the second and third phosphate, so this is, again, ATP, when you break this, you release a lot of energy. So this is kind of like the gas for a lot of the molecular machinery inside your cell. It's by breaking this bond between this adenosine, between the second and third phosphate. So actually when you do this, you get inorganic phosphate and you get something called ADP, so diphosphate, so di meaning two. So now you have two phosphates left over and a leftover phosphate over here. Okay, so how does this relate to the sodium potassium pump? Well, actually in the cell at rest, you have more sodium on the outside than on the inside and more potassium on the inside than you have on the outside. But so what, how, say we want to, how do you get the, it that way? Well, one thing, this sodium potassium pump is crucial in actually making that imbalance between the sodium on the outside of the cell and the potassium on the inside. So what this pump does is that it uses ATP, so it's actually going to grab three sodium ions and then use ATP. And why does it need ATP? For energy. Because you have all the sodium here on the outside and if you didn't have energy, that sodium would just push all the sodium from that's trying to cross to the outside back into the cell. But now that you have the additional gas from ATP and the energy, it's going to allow sodium to be brought to the outside. And before it resets back to where it was, it's going to bring in two potassium ions. So every round right here is going to use ATP to pump out sodium, bring in potassium, pump out sodium, bring in potassium. And what is the end result? We now know notice that we were able to add more sodium where there were already, where, where there was already a lot of sodium, and we add more brought more potassium into the cell, which was already full of potassium. So that's primary active transport. 